our next guest is a strong contender for coach of the year after his gym city kickboxing has had some huge wins with fighters such as Shane Young, Kai Kara Francis, Raul Adesanya, Dan Hooker. And now this weekend, Alex Wolkanovsky, one of the great minds in the sport. Eugene Barrowman, welcome to Submission Radio. And look at that. It's great to have you on the program, man. Thanks for joining us. Hey, guys. Nah, uh, yeah, good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. It's good to be chatting to you again. And of course, in city kickboxing of all places, how fitting. Um, congratulations on a fantastic win this past weekend. Alex Volkanovsky, you in his corner. Just before we talk about the fight itself, just wondering, what, what was your trip to Brazil like? Any any interesting experiences? And how did you sort of rate Brazil overall as you led your fighter to, to defeat another Brazilian legend? Uh, uh, Brazil was, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot different to New Zealand, put it that way. Uh, yeah. I've been there a few times. I've been there a few times, and uh, obviously in New Zealand, there's some um, freedoms that I enjoy that I take for granted a little bit, like uh, being able to walk down the street safely. <laughs> and uh, in Brazil, you have to be a little bit careful, and I, I, and I'm spoiled over here, so I'm not used to that. But I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed the the moment, and obviously uh, a lot of those fight trips are all predicated on. Uh, how well the fight went. If the fight went well, then generally you have a really great trip. Hmm. It's the best ever. And uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, things went well for us. Mm. Yeah. Now, is it is it unsafe for anybody walking down or is it primarily yourself, Huge? Because you've taken out another Brazilian legend. <laughs> First Anderson Silva, now Jose Aldo. Maybe that people just know Huge is walking down the street whenever you come back to Brazil these days. <laughs> nah, I just, if, if you... If you're a thrower and you stick out like a sore thumb, you got to watch your back a little bit. But uh, the, the Brazilians are like, after the fight towards us, they were very respectful of all the fans and stuff, to be honest. So, yeah, good on them. That's, that's the good thing. That's the main thing that counts. I was going to say, take us through Alex Volkanovsky's performance and sort of what you made of it. Um, what your assessment was, because I know you've spoken before in the past about feints and how important feints are, um, and in in some ways they can be the keys to winning fights. And it seemed like Volkanovski was fainting a lot and kind of froze and shut down Aldo in a lot of moments. And Aldo seemed confused by it as well. How would you rate Volkanovski's performance? Uh, I thought it was uh, master, like a masterclass. Um, he he did everything we wanted him to do uh, to a T and you don't always you don't always get that kind of success like when you're t in terms of like uh, uh, you know practicing the game plan and actually bringing the game plan to fruition uh, he did everything we asked and our game plan was on point like uh, me Joe Lopez and Brad Riddell uh, we put together something that was uh, really came to the forefront in that fight so we're, I was very happy with with Alex's performance and uh, yeah I thought it was a uh, top notch performance I mean obviously Alex is a special kind of guy what was it like working with him going into this fight and do you sort of expect that we'll see him training more with you at City Kickboxing for his future camps yeah I think Alex will you know like I mean I can't read the future but uh, for the for the for the for for the next few years Alex will definitely um, you know do all his camps here like uh We've just been working on him for a few years now, and and sometimes, I mean, a lot of the times, let's make it clear, like, um, <clears throat> I'm like my role is more in an advisory role. I don't hold an awful lot of pads for for um, Volko and stuff, but I do a lot of game planning and a lot of analysis for him. And Brad Riddell, who was one of my students, who was the head coach, striking coach at Tiger Muay Thai for. Uh, many quite a few you know three or four years he holds a lot of um volco's pads and uh through bread uh, we game plan and we figure out a good you know a, a sequence that uh, volco needs to follow for his learning for for like even for even 12 months you know for the next 12 months we've mm. already worked that out where we need to take volco where we think we need to take volco to get him to a level above his competition, basically, like, yeah, I consult with Brad and Joe Lopez on that, and we we decide really early on where Bolt needs to be from day one to probably 12 months in terms of like skill development. We probably look ahead that far. Mm. 
it's interesting that you guys sort of look so far ahead because it seems like you're always looking at the entire division, sort of, you know, what, what the future possibilities are. And of course, after this fight, a lot of people expected Alex to get the next title shot, but now it seems like it's going to be Frankie Edgar versus Max Holloway. What was your reaction to the news? And, and how do you sort of digest something like that, obviously, with Volkanovski on a massive streak, picking up a massive win, and then not really getting that title shot? <coughs> Gutted, mate. <laughs> Absolutely livid. 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 Like, we talked about this for such a long time. We talked about it, but, but our team talked about it. We need to... Our goal was to set the scenario up, and for all, for all our knowledge, this is what the UFC were were looking for. This is what they wanted. They, wanted, they needed Volko to win that fight. They needed Israel to get into the position. And then we got a, 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 an Australasian supercard set up yeah all all because of the work that we've put in and the position we've put ourselves into um and that was all to get to this goal to get to that supercard and we were obviously the ufc was on a different page we didn't think so but um <coughs> yeah absolutely gutted like it's is it not obvious i mean uh, and it's, this has nothing to do with frankie I mean, I don't know Frankie. I don't know his coaches. I don't know his management or anything. And it's not about that Frankie doesn't deserve it. He probably does deserve it. He just doesn't deserve it more than Alex Volkanovsky deserves it. Unfortunately for Frankie, him and his team advised him to take that risky fight against Brian Ortega and and fully understand why you've got to do that because you can't wait around forever. Your family has to eat. You have to earn money. Okay? But... It's called a risk for a reason. And I know Volko already alluded to this, but it's called a risk for a reason. Unfortunately, he lost, and then he beat Cub Swanson, so he's now he's won one fight. Now he's going into the total fight. Wow. Volko has won seven. Outside of the UFC, he's 17 in a row. Seven straight. Just beat Aldo, who, who uh, Frankie's fought twice and never managed the best. Yeah. Um, if you... The, the, the popular opinion out there amongst fans and all these experts and so-called experts and analysts is that Volker was a next in line and we were on that same um, thought train and then to have it whipped out from underneath us is uh, devastating for our team devastating to be honest mm. yeah appreciate the honesty and you know also if, if you're doing a stadium show in Australia you need as many big names as possible right the ones that are going to attract the the casual Australian fans and if you have one Australian fighting for a belt and obviously a Kiwi that's great but if you have two Australians fighting for a belt it, it, it doesn't get any better than that so you know the, the dream was to do that in October in <coughs> Sydney what what do you guys do now with with Alex Volkanovsky does he sit out and wait does he does he take another fight in the well, interim what happens well I mean, back to what you alluded to before, like, come on, like the last, yes, we get some fight nights down here, but down here, down in Australasia, we've been working hard. We've been doing what we need to do to get these guys to a level where they can get international recognition. We don't need to bring Holly Holm and Ronda Rousey over here anymore to do a super card because we've been toiling away and now we can do it ourselves. Now we've got a pair of fighters that can headline a card, they can fill a stadium from our own backyard and you know like we've done the work to get there so this is what i mean to get it taken away what well you know israel was particularly gutted about this because this was our plan all along but you know israel actually alluded to me um from nigeria he said he, he told me not to panic because at the end of the day the ufc haven't given him a date for a fight so, you know, maybe I'm getting a little bit too antsy over nothing because no date has come forward over my desk or Israel's desk for the Robert Whitaker fight. So, I mean, Israel will do it in November. He'll do it in December. Israel's, Israel was happy to wait until the winner of uh, Edgar and Holloway is, ready, is, is healed up and ready to fight a little bit later in October. Like, there's no official date has been given to, given to us. He would so he would do that for so Volkanovski. He he would wait longer so just so they could fight together if, on the card. If we don't look after our teammates and the UFC is not going to look after us, who's going to look after us? Hmm. Who's going to look after us? I can't complain. You know, like I've got to manage the situation. I understand that, but if, but I can't complain about that. That's the kind of team that I've set up. A team that looks after each other. 
a team that's loyal, looks after each other and has each other's back. So I can't complain about things like that. But who who's told you guys that, that the fight's going to be in October? Mm. Well, that's the thing. It's just... Well, that's the thing. It's just there's there's no there's no official date, and that's what I was yeah. going to ask you about, Huge. Yeah. I mean, first we heard about August. You know, <laughs> Rubble Whitaker was talking about August, but obviously August was way too soon for Israel to turn around after that fight with Calvin Gaslam. Can you sort of take us through what the process that you've sort of went through? So you haven't had any information. Has the UFC alluded to any date whatsoever? Did they suggest an August date for you <coughs> initially before? sort of October started floating around, or are we all just in the dark here? Not one single contact regarding that fight has been given my way. But August is out of the question. Um, it's just too early. And, um, I mean, we could do October, but what's the difference between October and November? You know? And let's, let's, let's wait for the winner of that fight to have enough time to have some downtime and heal up and let's do the card in November. If you haven't, if there's no date set yet, if you haven't given us a date, if you haven't passed a date over our table, then that's fine. As far as Israel's concerned, then there's, there's no date set, so why not just push it back? And, I mean, um, I, I, I mean I'm not going to speak for Robert, but, I mean, you've got to back up your, other, your fellow, you know, compatriots. So I don't know how he feels. I don't, he probably don't want to, you know, he, I don't know if he wants to put himself out there for Volko, but let's do it later then. If you don't have a date, if you haven't given us a date, we'll do it later, then we can do Volko, we can do Israel, we can set up that Australasian supercard, uh, be the biggest event in history in this region ever. It'll be bigger than Holly Home and Ronda Rousey. Why will it be bigger than Holly Home and Ronda Rousey? Because it's using our guys. Our guys are doing it. Mm. That's why it'll be bigger. So, I mean, I maybe just got a little bit antsy when I heard Volko um, didn't get the fight, but maybe it's still going to happen. It can just happen later. Mm. Well, well, I mean, you mentioned it. A lot of the fighters on that super card are guys that you've sort of built up to that level. How do you feel about that fight card happening in Sydney and not in New Zealand as sort of Israel spoke about um, a long time ago, having that super card in New Zealand? Is, is it disappointing to you that that fight card probably won't be happening in New Zealand? A, 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 a little bit. A little bit disappointing because we thought it had a real good chance because, um, you know, like, I, I, I see this fight. You know how I see this fight? I see this fight as New Zealand versus New Zealand. <laughs> and for a lot of reasons, a lot of people see it Australia versus New Zealand, and they have, obviously, they can see it that way, but... In this fight, you can draw the lines in so many directions. Yeah. Like, there's going to be Nigeria um, versus New Zealand, Nigeria, Australia, Australia versus New Zealand. But I choose to see it New Zealand versus New Zealand. You know, two champions, two Kiwis fighting. How big is that in our own country? But we're happy. We're happy as long as the fight is in our region. I mean, this is this is where we this is where we grew up. This is where we travelled to Australia and did all those battles with Australians. This is where we. This is where we found our feet in this area. This is why we do it. So we just need to have the fight uh, in our region. If it's Australia, that's fine. Um, that's understandable as well. Robert's the champion. Robert's from Sydney. Yeah, we're perfectly happy with that. That's only a three-hour uh, flight for all of our uh, supporters and stuff. So we're happy also to do it in Australia. But the thing they can't do is move this fight somewhere else. For both those guys, not just for Israel, but for, for Volko as Volko's done the hard work to get himself that big fight in uh, Australia too. So um, I'm not going to rule it out. We're going to do everything we can to get those two guys on a super card in Australia. Mm. Just sort of while we're talking about Robert Whitaker and Israel Adesanya fight that a lot of people are really excited to see, you know, sometime this year. When we spoke to Robert not long ago, he told us that he believed that uh, when he watched Israel against Calvin, that the schedule that Israel was was putting on sort of caught up with him a little bit. Rob believed that Israel didn't want to be in there against Calvin. Um, sort of, uh, did you at all in any way get that impression? Did you observe that as a coach? And after this fight, was it at all sort of important to um, to give Israel a bit of a break? Did you feel he needed a break, or did you feel that the schedule was just fine and he could have theoretically continued to you know keep on fighting, you know, even you know in October, November, or whenever the, the date would come? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't listen to all that stuff. I don't know. I don't know what <laughs> like to make of a what kind of a hypothesis is that? Like to watch a fight and figure out what's inside a guy's mind just from telling that. Like, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's just Robert and Israel going back with the. That's just mm-hmm. gamesmanship. Mm. I mean, he won the fight. He was there, and he put on a hell of a performance. Like, where did where did you? I mean, how did he find that? Did he look into Israel's eyes magically and see something? I don't know. That's those guys playing games. They can play their games. I don't give a shit. Like, like they, they're going to fight, so they can play as many games as they want. I mean, Robert, Rod, Robert should just do Robert. I don't know if he does it. Does he analyze fights and stuff? I don't know. He obviously started. But anyway, yeah, I don't pay any attention to that. All I know is that Israel is a master at what he does and everything's calculated inside and outside the ring. Every little uh, piece that he puts on the chessboard is calculated. So um, all Robert has to do is just go about his business like he usually does. If he goes out of character and tries to do things that aren't normal, then you're, yeah, unfortunately, then you're giving Israel, uh, you know, an ascendancy where he doesn't, you know, like where he shouldn't have it. Like just, just be you. Just, just be you. <laughs> Don't try and magically analyze fights and figure it, and try and figure out that <laughs> Israel shouldn't be there. I don't know. I'd, just, I'd try to stay out of it like that. Those two, I'm sure, are going to go at it, and uh, they're going to build up a great fight. They're going to build up a massive fight that needs a dance partner, and that dance partner is Alex Volkanovski. That's mm. what I know. Mm. It's interesting that you mention that because obviously with the Anderson Silva fight, a lot of it was, you know, Anderson's going to try and sort of befriend Israel during fight week. And then we sort of, a, a lot of us knew what to expect from Anderson. When it, when it comes down to Sydney, though, it looks like sort of Robert Whitaker, like you mentioned, and Israel will sort of have a bit of a back and forth. But the interesting thing is because uh, Rob is from Sydney, it, it seems like he might sort of be the good guy and Israel might get a few boos here and there. I mean, you mentioned that the mental game. You're sort of focusing more on the fighting, but is there anything you need to do to prepare Israel for dealing with a bunch of boos and sort of fans, I suppose, saying negative things to him during fight week because it's more sort of Rob's hometown? Is there any kind of effect that you think that might have on Israel? Zero. I mean, the guy is... the guy. I mean, he's a master at that... At that all that psychological and all those sort of antics that go on it's outside the fight. That's his thing. He's a master at doing that. Um, <clears throat> and this is where you're going to fall over yourself if you try and do a Derek Brunson type uh, reaction where you try and go outside of what you normally do. The best way is just to just ignore it and carry on with what you're doing because he's so clearly obvious, obviously trying to get some sort of reaction anything and the minute you do that minute you go outside of your norm normal behavior then you've then you've shown that you've shown him what he wants and then it's just then then it's a downward spiral so like i said i that's his that's his thing i concentrate on my thing what him and robert do if they want to go back and forth for me i just i don't you know i, I must be too old but that <laughs> stuff's over that stuff's over my head. Like, I just don't understand it. I'm too old school. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, well tell, tell us, when you look at Robert Whitaker as a fighter and as a challenge, uh, what do you rate him in, in the challenges that Israel's faced? And so how do you look at him as a fighter and what he's able to do in that octagon? He's the best. He's the best middleweight in the world. And he's the best uh, MMA fighter that we would have faced. Um... Yeah, yeah, I don't know. How much detail do you want me to go into? <laughs> well, we we, 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 we like picking your, your we like picking your brain, so it's it's an open forum for you, huge. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> from a general point of view, he's the best middleweight in the world. He has been for a long time, <clears throat> and where people go wrong, where people have often gone wrong, is they haven't give Robert his due respect mm-hmm. and there's a difference between saying you're going to give him his due respect and actually giving it and I'm definitely not going to fall into that trap because 
I know how good Robert is. I've watched all his fights from going back a couple of years now and been building up for this moment, uh, you know, for all of Israel's career. We're not going to make silly mistakes like that. We have one, I mean, I have 100 respect for it. Every part of Robert's game and what he can do for Israel, what you know, what he can bring for Israel, and yeah, I won't fall into any of those sorts of traps that other opponents I think have fallen into by not giving Robert his due respect. Mm. I mean, it's it's exciting to hear, obviously, that you know we're going to get the best version, the best, the, the most well prepared version of Israel for this fight, it, whenever it does happen. Just quickly before we let you go, huge. Um, just wanted to ask you about this John Jones thing with Israel and John Jones at one point sort of going back and forth after the KG fight. John Jones didn't really have much interest, but Israel told us that at one point he sort of asked you about John Jones. Like, would you have a recipe for how to beat John Jones? And you sort of texted him and, and sort of, you know, said that, well, you know, here's the rough game plan, but don't worry about that. We're focusing on something else. Is that true? Did you guys sort of speak at one point about, you know, how to potentially de defeat John Jones? Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, he messaged me uh, weeks before they went back and forth on social media. Again, like, I just don't understand that, but <laughs> he messaged me, uh, yeah, like, it might have been three or four weeks before that, like, how do we beat John Jones? Just that, just that was the text, how do we beat John Jones? Nothing else. That's the only thing he sent, and I was like, that kind of, like, took me back. I was like, <laughs> we do this, we do that blah 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 but and at the end I said look that's you know, what you're talking about is irrelevant like we have so many things to accomplish before we even start to look at John Jones let's like keep our eye on what's in front of us and not get skewed by some other secondary goal that we've got to accomplish later on let's focus so that was my kind of stereotypical reply but I needed <laughs> to that's, that's what I needed to say at the time it's interesting yeah. that you mentioned. It's interesting that you mention that because a lot of fans, when hearing about that fight, are like, "Israel has so much left to do at middleweight. You know, why would he ever really fight John Jones anytime soon?" I mean, do you, do you see a scenario where Israel moves up in weight, you know, anytime soon? It, it would be something that would have to happen years from now, wouldn't it? After he sort of won the title, defended it, did a bunch of other things in the division, and and and. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is he the? Does he cut a lot of weight to get a middleweight? It seems like he's sort of more of a natural middleweight to us. No, he doesn't cut a lot of weight to get to middleweight, but he still probably walks around at like heavyweight. Um, I mean, I yeah, I've always been an advocate for not cutting much weight. Let your skills do the talking. Um, you know, let your skills do the talking. Don't let some weight cut erode your skills let's see if you're really good at fighting let's like see the you and 100 percent health put your skills against another person and 100 percent health i would be all for israel fighting at his walk around weight that's the best that would be the best possible version of israel you could possibly get israel fighting at his walk around weight his walk around weights about that light heavyweight limit so he would walk into that fight with it like I can't give you a timeline on that. Israel, I mean, the guy fought, how many times has he fought? Like six times. Mm -hmm. if, he, if he fights another six times, if, you, you know, from now to the next 40 months, then what's there going to be left at middleweight? Yeah. yeah. You so like, yeah. And then, then it could be upon us like sooner than you think. I don't know. Mm, I don't it's, know. Fa it's fascinating, Focus. fascinating that you mentioned that. I'm focused on one guy, so none of that even enters my mind until you ask me about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got, I got, I got one more question for you. I mean, when you spoke yeah. about Anderson, and uh, we were, we brought up that Anderson's one of the greatest of all time, but also obviously he had a, a, a history with PEDs and some controversies. How do, how do you view John Jones? He's someone that everybody sort of sees as pound for pound the best fighter, but he's also had a lot of controversies in his career. Where, where does he sort of rank for you on that all-time list? He doesn't rank on it at all. He doesn't rank it at all because it's in, everything he's done is into question. I, I mean, as a fighter, you have to rate him. You have to rate him as a fighter. Um, I'm not going to get drawn into, like, my opinion, and most people, like, I don't want to get caught in that trap. My opinion doesn't matter. 
you guys are asking my opinion, so it matters to you. To us, yes. Mm. To we us. care about but you. For, <laughs> we yeah, care about you. For the, for the most part, everybody in this new age world where they go on the internet and stuff, they don't realize what I realize. And what I realize is, in my opinion, doesn't mean shit. The only difference between me and most people is they don't know that. <laughs> so I don't want to get drawn into giving my opinion on John Jones, but as a as a person, he's obviously a shit bloke, what we call over here a shit bloke. <laughs> but as a fighter, he's he's very good. But I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know where to put him in a pound for pound stakes. But if that fight comes up, and you got to remember, like fighters need to protect themselves against people like John Jones. You know, you know what I'm saying? Against people like Anderson Silva, you have to protect yourselves against people like TJ Dillashaw. If the UFC, if USADA is not going to protect the fighters and the fighters have to do it themselves, you know, Israel didn't have to take that fight against Anderson Silva. He had a choice. He had a choice. He gets a choice against everybody that's had a USADA violation. He gets a choice. You can't force that fight upon us. We get a choice whether we, go, we take it or not. This is how you protect yourself against people that have cheated and they only get a two-year sanction. You protect yourself in your contract. So that's how we protect ourselves against those sort of people that continually cheat and stuff. So, And, and other fighters need to learn from us, um, and that, that's how you do it. See, you say no one cares about your opinion, man, but we, we could sit here talking to you all day. It's absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Like even, <laughs> even when we spoke to you last time in Melbourne, we came away, we're like, man, listen to you talk all day but look we don't want to be greedy with your time i think we already have been really appreciate the time you oh, guys obviously he runs one of the top mma gyms in the world not just in australasia the world city kickboxing we hope that there's at least one person watching this interview who at some point you know grows up and says you know that's the guy that i want to be my coach my mentor make sure to vote for him and city kickboxing in this year's mma awards for gym of the year and if you're in auckland make sure to visit the gym and get a workout in and go to citykickboxing.net.nz for more information huge thank you so much for your time man you're welcome on the program anytime really appreciate chatting with you and you chatting with us Thank you, guys. Love what you guys do for uh, the MMA scene, especially around our, uh, our area out here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Huge. Appreciate it. Bye.